Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa Venti at um, Harvard Library's Digital Strategies in Innovations team, at where I run the Curiosity Service, and I work closely with curators to assist them through the collection building process from idea to launch and beyond. I also work really closely with designers and user experience experts and developers to implement new features and analyze ways to improve the library's digital collections infrastructure. And today I'm gonna show you how Harvard makes its collection data available, or its catalog data available available both internally and externally. We have nearly 25 million records from four different cataloging systems. And over the years, we've wrangled this data into one place, which has enabled us to complete several major digitization, digital collection projects. So during this presentation, I'm gonna talk about some digital collections problems that we needed to solve and how we created a new digital collections infrastructure with Library Cloud at its core to solve these problems. I'll explain what Library Cloud is and step you through the process of how a record gets into Library Cloud, becomes part of a collection, and then makes its way to end users. I'll then touch on some of the major projects we were able to accomplish with our new infrastructure and end with some lessons we learned along the way. But before I go into the details, I always love starting with this quote because it really gets to the heart of why this work is so important and meaningful to us. So I'll read it to you. Um, I teach history at a community college and we've been studying medicine and vaccination this year. Your archive has been invaluable in our study of the past and I'm deeply grateful for the contagion exhibit that you've assembled. You've helped us, helped us all understand past perspectives and apply it to modern popular perceptions of vaccination. Thank you very much for collecting these pieces and placing them online for free. So this work began as most work does because we needed to solve some problems. First, it was hard for researchers to find and identify all of our publicly accessible digitized materials. These items were scattered across various search interfaces and buried within catalogs of non-digitized material and material that is restricted to the Harvard community. However, we did have a couple dozen collection websites that showcased groups of these items, but unfortunately, this brings me to our second problem, which is that these collections were built on custom software that was now unsupported and needed to be migrated. And so because of this, curators could no longer build new collections, which we knew, we knew was really important to our community. And finally, we had contributed some of these aging to collections to DPLA over the years, but we wanted to share new collections with them and other aggregators. And for that, we knew we needed both a new infrastructure as well as a way to streamline the rights review process for public access and sharing of collections. So how did we solve our problems? We used Library Cloud, which is a solar index that streamlines access to our metadata. Library Cloud makes a copy of the metadata in all of our library catalogs, and we transform that data to put it in a consistent format and clean up and enrich some key fields and terms in the process. And then Library Cloud makes the data available through both internal and external APIs. The item API searches almost 25 million records from our four main catalogs. And the collection API allows us to create groups of records that can then be made harvestable via OAI PMH. So now I'm going to walk you through the process of how a record gets into Library Cloud, becomes part of a collection, and then makes its way to end users. So the process starts by pulling in and transforming metadata from our main catalogs. Next, we, uh, during the ingest process, we normalize and enrich the record metadata. And so a few examples of this are, 
we enrich records with text code equivalents. So for example, Massachusetts is added to records containing the code MAU. For single dates, we add start and end point dates to support date range searching. So for example, 1910 get the start date of 1908 and an end date of 1912. And we normalize our 175 repository name variations down to just a mere 88. <laughs> so to get a visual sense of what this looks like, here are our 175 unnormalized repository names. And you can see some of them are really long and some are just a few letter code and there's lots of duplication among this list. And this happens because the metadata is coming in from different systems where there are constraints on the way the raw repository can be expressed in those systems. So this is our normalized list of 88 names. And even at the small font size, you can get a sense of just how much cleaner this second list is. And then we also create a separate list of short form variations in Library Cloud that we use for faceting. So next, we enrich the records further by adding metadata from our digital repository, which stores all of the digital files linked in our catalogs. And this metadata gives us that crucial piece of data we're looking um, that I mentioned earlier, who um, that those researchers we're looking for um, for our publicly accessible content, and that is our access flag, which identifies which items are open to the public. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once our metadata records have been ingested, normalized, and enriched, we're now ready to create a set of records to begin building a collection. And for that, we use an application called set filter. To create a set, we simply fill out a set record and upload the list of IDs we want added to our set. Here's what a set record for the Chinese rubbings collection looks like. And of this metadata, these three fields get written to each record in Library Cloud, now making them part of the Chinese rubbings collection set. So now that we have a set of records to work with, um, uh, but it's not publicly accessible yet. So first we need to check to make sure that the metadata looks good in Library Cloud. And for that, we use the review tool. And the review tool enables us to quickly export spreadsheets of some of the records metadata needed for review. And here's where we find out if there were any problems in the ingest process, like records missing digital object links. Um, and then once that all looks good, the spreadsheets move on to the copyright and risk assessment review. At this stage, we identify items presumed to be in the public domain, items in copyright, and items that need further review. When the review is finished, all cleared items remain in the set and any items in copyright or still in question are removed. So now our collection set is finalized and ready to be made public through Library Cloud's OAI PMH data provider. Once available in this format, it can be harvested to our curated collections platform called Curiosity, as well as to external aggregators such as DPLA. Library Cloud also has a publicly accessible item API that contains the 25 million records. The data in the item API is available in both mods as well as Dumplin core schemas and can be returned in either XML or JSON formats. We use the item API as our backend to Harvard Digital Collections, which is our new discovery interface for searching our 6 million plus publicly accessible digitized items. And because the item API itself is publicly accessible, anyone can create external applications to use this data as well. So this completes the library cloud picture. So what have we been able to accomplish using 
this new infrastructure. As you just saw in the walkthrough, Library Cloud's item API enabled us to easily create a new discovery interface called Harvard Digital Collections for our publicly accessible material. Now researchers are finally able to quickly identify Harvard's freely available treasures without having to sift through the noise of records that contain uh, restricted or not digitized content. Harvard Digital Collections is built on Blacklight, but instead of using Blacklight Solar, it reads Library Cloud Solar directly, so it's always up to date with the latest Library Cloud updates. Library Cloud also enabled us to migrate 22 legacy collections that contained over 43,000 items in total. And these collections were originally created on custom software using technology that was no longer supported or secure. And Library Cloud provided us with the key tools needed to create these collections in a new stable environment. And this migration project paved the way for us to build our collection building service Curiosity. And these 22 collections became the first Curiosity collections. And Curiosity is built on Spotlight, which as you all know, is an open source content management system developed by Stanford. And we really love Spotlight because it has so many great features such as faceting and browsing of items in a variety of views. And it lets curators build custom pages where they can highlight items and themes within their collection in a lot of different ways. And this was just, all these features were just not not features we had previously so it was a great improvement to migrate to spotlight and so we just launched the service last year and we've received and started working on several new collection building requests and so far we've gotten uh, very positive feedback from curators who are excited to showcase their collections in these new ways so here are a couple of quotes we received from our users when they first saw the new collection interfaces. I'm blown away by the new platform for daguerreotypes at Harvard. The faceted searching makes exploring this content really effective and fun. Wow, I've just taken a glance through the website and it looks amazing. It has me thinking that I might want to start a long-term project around these, around the broadsides for my seminar. So finally, Library Cloud enabled us to share 16 of these collections containing nearly 66,000 items with DPLA. This work has laid the foundation for us to contribute new collections with them and other aggregators. Using Library Cloud's review tool, we've been able to streamline the rights review process for public access and sharing of these collections, which means we can, tr can contribute our collections more quickly, easily, and safely. To date, 12 collections have been created or added uh, items using this process. And then finally, I wanted to end with some lessons that we learned along the way from this work. First, it's important to build your collections as sustainably as you can. For us, this means doing things like making corrections and, and, and enhancements in the source catalog record whenever possible instead of further down the ingest pipeline. We learn from our migration that some enrichments we made to the records outside of our source catalogs weren't sustainable to recreate and maintain as our infrastructure changed. So as a result, we're being really thoughtful about which new features the infrastructure can support long term and which features might only live in our current UIs. And second, when working with such large amounts of data, automated tests are needed to help identify and prevent issues. Inevitably, whenever we create a new collection, we discover new issues to troubleshoot. And to help us analyze the issues, we have a Python script that queries library cloud for key pieces of data that we want to make sure look good even before we, we create a new set. And this script 
lets us quickly see if there are any missing digital object links, missing thumbnails, or if the record is missing from Library Cloud entirely. Often there is more than one problem to fix, so having a tool to efficiently look at a set of records is especially useful when whittling down a list of problem records as they get fixed one by one. So this brings me to my last lesson, which is that metadata is messy and it's always gonna be messy. And I think as librarians, we all know this, but I don't think we've accepted it. And digital collection websites are gonna expose these inconsistencies in the metadata. But I think instead of thinking of this as a negative, it can be thought of as an opportunity to target cleaning up metadata fields or key fields to improve searching and browsing collections. So if you're an analyst or a developer like myself who supports digital collections work, making a copy of this metadata creates a lot of flexibility, but it also means that you rely on a few key fields such as the links to the digital object and the source catalog to appear consistently. And so my advice is to focus your efforts on getting key fields like these to always come through as those are gonna be the biggest showstoppers for end users if they aren't present. And then if you're a cataloger or a curator, I think it can be really easy to get caught up on like prettying up the metadata for display. But in reality, our end users aren't looking at our metadata with that same credit critical lens that we are. And so instead, um, I would say focus on normalizing and enriching records with the metadata fields that your users are actually searching and browsing the most frequently. And so I think this is a great chance to dig into your analytics. So that's all I have. Thank you all. I'm happy to take questions. Thank, Thanks, thank Vanessa. You, Vanessa. Um, I, I saw this um, presentation at DLF, but um, it was nice to be able to see it again and really focus more on it. Um, and really great job. I love what you all are doing at Harvard. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Vanessa, would you would you be able to share that slide? Oh, absolutely. Um, that slide yeah. You I'm, can put it in the chat. You I can put a link I in the chat even, section. Yeah, I, oh yeah, I can do that. Um, I think I even put a link to it in the notes too. Did I do ah, that? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, maybe not yet, but I will. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to share that in the chat right now. Thanks. Then we can add it to the wiki as well, Vanessa. Yes, I think I already put it on there. Yeah, you probably the have, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just want to be conscious of the fact that we're still recording. So I wanted to see if anybody had specific questions for Vanessa um, um, b before I end the recording. So I do, uh, Vanessa, if, you, uh, if, if I may then. So if, if somebody comes in and they have a bunch more items in the Chinese rubbings collection and they want to add it, uh, how, does, how do you extend those collections? So it's pretty much the same um, process as, as creating the collection to begin with. Um, it's just that your, you know, the site's already set up. So all really that needs to happen is the curator would give us a new list of IDs that they want to be added to the set. And then it'll go through that same review process where we'll check to make sure everything looks good in Library Cloud, and then we'll um, you know, do the copyright and risk assessment. And once that's all cleared, we just harvest that new uh, set of items to the collection. And on the spotlight side, does it automatically pick that up or do I have to go back in and re-ingest re something on the spotlight side? 
we have to go in and re-harvest. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that is something that maybe down the road, it would be nice if it sort of uh, automatically picked up changes because the other thing that doesn't happen automatically is if someone updated a catalog record in the source catalog, um, we it updates to Library Cloud automatically, but it doesn't update to Spotlight automatically. So we would still have to go in and and um, reharvest re the collections to get those updates. Yeah, thank you. I think that that my guess is that that's probably going to have to be um, a locally based enhancement because everybody um is pulling in or harvesting their content in different ways right from right. different repos i know um for us automated um refreshing would cause a problem because we have cases this is just one use case i can think of um where if you add a unique identifier for a collection in our environment right and let's say the collection has a thousand items in it. You add the single unique identifier for the collection. It will pull in all of the items in the collection, all 1,000 items. Well, let's say for whatever reason that you add 500 more items to the collection, but you don't want the 500 more items in your spotlight exhibit. <laughs> mm -hmm. if, 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 if that was automatically refreshing, right? you would get 500 new items in there and you would be like, oh no, <laughs> you know? And there's, there's some other sort of twists that I can think of. Um, or maybe it's something that in the future um, is an option, a toggleable option, mm -hmm. you know? I, I'm not really sure, but interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And I don't think it's really a top priority for us to have that happen because it's really not a big deal to to just go and do a reharvest, you know? It's really right. clicking a button. So so yeah, and there's a lot more things we would want to prioritize developing first. Um we automatically index, so if you ever want to talk about that, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, a follow-up question I have are all of the items in your spotlight index also in your digital collection site? No, it's only the ones that are in the harvested sets. Or, oh, okay. or yeah, in the sets that we harvest. So everything in spotlight is in Harvard digital collections, but not the other way around. Right. That's, I think that was my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you find, are they, do they interlink in some way? Is there any confusion by what the purpose of your Spotlight site is if the items are also in your digital collection site? There is, yeah, um, we do get that question. Right now in Harvard Digital Collections, um, the, the filtering and faceting options are much more limited than Spotlight and, um, and I think people really understand. I think, I think once that once we explain to them, well, Spotlight, you know, is where you can just search and browse items within just a particular collection, and it also has the additional layer where you can build on those narrative pages. Then people really get that idea um, and and see the benefit. And and I think also people understand too well you, you know you're not going to want to go through that effort for every collection um, and so harvard digital collections is a really great way to to link off to when you have a collection that you know you don't really need that dedicated searching um, or you don't have additional pages that you want to add so so i think it's definitely um we're, we're definitely needing to explain the differences and get staff up to speed, but they seem to, to get it once we, once we explain the benefits of each. Do you have like a, when you talk to patrons or random researchers or whatever, do you have like a, 
a place that you want them to come? Like, wh what's your, would you rather a patron come to your digital site to explore and your digital and your spotlight instance is more like a advertisement sort of situation or? Um, well, actually, I think the one place where we want people to start or discover is our, our library website. If I don't know, can you still see my screen yep. here? Okay. Um, what we do is we make a collection page for all of our collections. And oh, I see. So if people are looking for collections, we ideally want them to, to come here. And this is like physical, digital, um, and also just random websites that people have made that aren't necessarily like centrally supported. And so everything that has a curiosity site is here, but there's lots of other stuff here as well that's you know, beyond our spotlight sites. And so basically if people are searching for collections, we want them to come here. But then if they're looking for that catalog search, then we would want to send them to Harvard Digital Collections. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. I was curious, um, your sites look really nice. I was wondering what kind of design and usability testing process you used. Oh, great question. Yeah, we, um, I'm trying to think. So I was not fully on the design team at the time. So I'm forgetting the software they use. I want to say they, they used React, but I could be wrong about that. Um, so we- I actually, I mean, more than just the software itself, I'd be very interested more in like the process, like where in the planning process did, did y'all engage in um, design or usability testing or those types of activities? Yeah, yeah. Well, so the design came in um, first by being informed. We redid our library website as a whole. And so the design, a lot of the elements, you know, came in from what was figured out already from that. And so it was uh, more a matter of getting Spotlight to match our current, um, you know, our, our, our current design for Harvard Library. And then um, we did usability testing like on uh, wireframe or mockups, you know, so we did it very early on in the process. And, um, and then it's, you also asked about accessibility as well. So we, this past fall, we underwent, the libraries went on, underwent a task force, um, to, uh, a, a new task force came out to review all of our major systems. And so in that process, we reviewed Spotlight. And so far we, so far, we've just documented all of the issues and came up with a. It was it was a big a big part of that task force was just to come up with a process for reviewing things for accessibility. So we use Site Improve, and we also did a manual review, um, just using like keyboard um, and mouse. You know, making sure that we could everything was accessible via the keyboard. And so we, we just kind of documented all the issues and then we came up with like a prioritization process to, to sort of figure out how, you know, low, medium and high, which ones that we would want fixed for whenever there was some development time for the, each of the sites, each of the systems. Were there any big insights that came out of any of the usability testing or I don't know if you were a part of that process or if you're familiar with the results? I'm trying to think. So for Spotlight specifically? Yeah. 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 Let me, let me think. Um, I know we definitely, well, oh, I'm signed in right now. Sorry. Let me sign out. Um, there was definitely a lot of testing we were trying to do between this explore collections page and the curiosity sites 
-hmm. because originally we um, had information on on these pages so so they, they could be a page like they used to be a page like this and then you would link off to curiosity but now we did some testing and then we found out well that's actually pretty confusing to users so if i look up a curiosity site like contagion this is just going to be a card so this like clicks off and then will take people directly to curiosity and so um and instead we kind of put the information that would have been on the other site over onto the spotlight site so that was a big a big thing we were testing um i think um and I think if there was any, I mean, it seemed like Spotlight overall, we did some testing on the labels of the headings for the um, so Spotlight navigation and those seemed great. The ones out of the box were perfect. People were like, yep, I get them. I know what they, those mean. Um, so that was really good. And then I think we also did some usability testing on the facets as well. But that was, I think that was more on the Harvard Digital Collection side and less on the Spotlight side. Um, yeah, I, th I think, oh, and the other thing I think we were testing was like the viewer. So, so yeah, I think overall, I don't think we really had any usability issues with Spotlight itself. It was more how we were integrating it with our other systems that we were testing and looking into. If that makes sense. Yeah. Did you get a chance to do another round of testing once you re-architected the, the interconnections there? I don't know if we've Sorry. done more testing since then, but I'm sure it will be upcoming because I know, um, yeah. And I know, I think the other thing I'm definitely going to look into is the analytics too, because um, I know we were getting like a lot of tickets for things like, um, like things that were curator questions that um, the people were submitting, like using down here in the footer, the contact us, like this link is really just supposed to be like site problems, not the curator, you know, if you have a reference question. And so I think one thing that we're going to just look at is to see have our analytics changed now that we have that like contact information on the spotlight itself. Um, so, so I think it's like things, things like that, that, that we're kind of wanting just to follow up with analytics to see if things have changed. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.